As I said before I started recording, I'm going to try to get through slideshows 9 and 10 today. Uh, projector cooperating. Um, then somebody asked, what are we doing next week? I'm not 100% sure yet. Um, probably going to answer questions and or go through people's labs. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to start with group commands. Basically, a group command is a series of commands that execute either in a shell or as a subshell. And you choose to run them as a group. So thus, brackets. And you separate the commands using a semicolon. And literally, that's all there is to it. So if you want to output a series of commands and have all the output happen at once, one after the other, you'd start with a bracket. For example, present working directory, who am I, and ls. So it'll show where you are, double check who you are, and output the content. And essentially, Group commands, it doesn't make a difference if you use a curly bracket or a square or a regular for a parentheses. The only difference is, and some of you have already experienced the joy, when you use regular parentheses, if you don't bugger, you'll notice there's no spaces after the parentheses. Between the parentheses, everything is glued together. When if you use curlies, you have spaces between, so it's curly space and then space curly. Why? Bash cell. Why is it like that? I have no idea. Just somebody decided how it was going to operate. Okay. Remember I was saying that this light show is kind of useless? Understanding loop theory. I think you guys took that in Java 1. If you didn't or you don't remember how to do a loop and you're now in Java 2, I think you, have, you should be rethinking your life. Um, Essentially, I'm going to skip all that because you guys know what a loop is. So the while loop syntax is slightly different than Java's. Um, if you've ever used a language like BASIC, this will look familiar. Because um, there's no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, curly brackets. Essentially, it's while condition do, bunch of statements, and then done. So you guys are probably used to a, a do, and then you have a loop and an end loop, or you have while, condition, curly, bunch of commands, close curly. Uh, the bookends in this case are do and done. It's probably the most logical statement you've ever seen in Bash. So for example, we're presetting a variable to n, stop equals no. While stop is not equal to yes, do. It runs a bunch of commands. Then it's done. So until basically put the read statement there, accepts a Y, it'll just keep outputting this menu over and over and over again. And then when it's done, well, it echoes that it's stopping. Yay. And that's essentially it. Although, mind you, you should probably check for uppercase and lowercase Y. Right? And you might want to check for the word yes, because some people are special that way. For example, you can use a while loop to test for the exit state situation. So when, if you run a command, you can wait till it's done. So while not copy, essentially until it returns something, it'll keep looping until the copy is done. Um, so it'll do attempting to copy. It'll sleep for 10 seconds. It'll still say attempting to copy. And once it manages to actually copy, the loop ends. So you can use it for a uh, progress monitor if you've learned about. Did you guys do sleep in Java yet? Not in Java, but you might have done it in DOS, right? The DOS batch files. Uh, most languages have a sleep command. Usually it's not the ideal way of making it wait for you. Because uh, if you, in your while statement, ends up being a never-ending uh, condition rush, you might end up with a never-ending loop. Usually, you'll want to use something like a callback. But yes, you can do this. And as usual, just like in Java, we have a break command. As you've noticed, the other thing also is you don't have any semicolons or brackets. This one's the same deal. Counts equal to 1, while true, do. And then as long as the count 
until uh, if the count's greater than three, it breaks. And can anybody see what's wrong with this code? Just asking. There's a bug in this. No? No. It's a logic error. Yeah? Pardon me? That's the one. Who's ever said that? I wish I had a cookie to give you. Um, this example has a really glaring big bug in it. It never increments the counter. And this is known as an infinite loop. And depending on your programming language, it's a great way to cook your CPU. Um, especially if you have a programming language that doesn't have a, um, but basically, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The ability to check for endless loops. A runaway statement, there we go. So it, if, unless you have a language that actually has built-in expiry capabilities, you know, you could theoretically damage your machine with something like this. And guess what? You can nest your while statements. You guys know how this works, nested loops. And there's an example. Now, there is a, a slightly different statement, which I don't know if Java has until. And it's a bit like the basic, the language, basic, the language called basic has a while, do, and they also have a do while. So it checks the condition at the end. Um, this has until condition. Um, as long as the condition is false, the command's executed. It does the opposite of a while. So while the condition is true, this happens. The until is the opposite. Um, if the condition is false, it executes. Once it hits true, it stops executing. So until stop is equal to y, it does stuff. So it's the complete opposite of the while. Okay. Who here doesn't know what a for loop is? Really? You're trying to be funny? OK, so the for loop is similar to what you've seen. There's actually a couple different examples. Um, you have two choices. You got four variables in a list. And anybody here who's familiar with PHP, this is the same thing as a for each statement. The for each command is a single word. Um, as far as I know, Java has the equivalent of for each. I just don't remember what it's called because um, I don't know Java. So, but it's basically the equivalent of a for each. So what it does, it loops through every element in a list. And as long as, so if there's four elements in the list, it'll loop four times. If there's ten elements in the list, it'll loop ten times. Or you got the arithmetic version of it, and it looks somewhat familiar to you guys, which is four. And you do your starting point, your operator value, and then your change, and then do and done. So for example, this is the for each version of it. So for my var in 2468, it'll loop four times. And it'll operate, it'll set my var equal to two, then four, then six, then eight. And you can also do ranges for i in 0 dot dot 10 dot dot 2 basically it's going to start at 0 go to 10 counting by twos totally different syntax than what you guys are used to seeing but it works so essentially it's going to say i it starts at 0 then it'll be 2 4 6 8 10 and then it'll expire and then all the java people are going to go oh this looks familiar now Notice double brackets. Notice lacks of spaces inside double brackets, at least on the inside edges. You can separate after the semicolon of the space, but inside the double brackets, no space. But this is just like the loops you're used to doing in Java. The syntax is different. So when it's time for you to do a loop in your bash files, you go, oh, I need to use a while loop. Ah, what's the syntax again? Slideshow 9. There's actually an example of every single way of using it in there. Now, and I'm pretty sure we covered this already, I think two weeks ago. Setting output and error messages to two different files. This rings a bell. 
like I said, so half these slides are useless because it's repeat. Um, if you want to output the contents of a program, you can choose to output to the standard out, which is output stream number one, and standard error, which is out, out stream number two. And if there's no number, it always assumes standard out. Yes, we did this already. Uh, although throwing away output, I don't think I covered. If you don't want to see any output, you output your content to slash dev slash null, and that's a special file in Linux. Anything that goes to dev null disappears into the ether, never be seen again. It is basically a, a black hole for data. It's a great spot to get rid of stuff. Um, I've even seen people copy files into slash dev slash null. Why? I don't know, but you can. Okay, we did find command, didn't we? Anybody here remember? I'm not asking you guys because you guys haven't learned anything. <laughs> I'm not naming teachers. Do you guys, do we, did I cover find? I thought so, I thought I did, but anyways, okay. The find command allows you to search for files in the file system. It's actually really handy inside your bash files. Um, because every once in a while you need to check to see if certain things exist, so you use the file command. And basically put, it searches through the directory tree based on the criteria that's specified. And the way it works is the command is find, the next one you give it is the path, in other words, where do you want it to start searching from? And then you give it the expressions. So if you don't give it a path, it assumes your present working directory. Where are you now in the tree structure? This is where it's gonna run from. The expression is a bunch of different options. There's tons of options. For example, you can search by the modified time. And what's kind of strange is if you go dash m time, which is dash modified plus 90, it means it wants to find files that are up to, that have been modified in the last 90 days. If you go negative 90, it'll search for files less than 90. Plus 90 means more than 90 days ago. Minus 90 means less than 90 days ago. And if you don't include the plus or the minus sign, it means exactly 90 days. And it uses days, not minutes and hours. Uh, you can search by file size. So find the current path size greater than 10K. And so once again, Negative, positive does the same thing as with the time. A negative 10K means any file 10K and smaller. Positive plus 10K means any file bigger than 10K. And if you don't give it a, a positive negative, it's a file that's exactly 10K. <coughs> you can search by name, star.mp3. Notice the quote marks. And does anybody want to take a guess why the quote marks need to be there? Well, the, the asterisk, why would it be need to be quoted? It's a wildcard character. It's a special character. And it's treated differently. And I just watched the projector flicker. Um, so it basically put, we'll search by name, anything that starts, or I should say anything that ends with MP3. Uh, you can search by type of file, dash type D means search for directories. You can go dash type F, search only files. Um, and you can search for a specific user. So you give it a username and away it goes. The cut command is allows you to strip text out of files and display the cut text on the screen or redirect it to another file is kind of cool. Um, and I know I covered this week two. Yeah. This one's familiar. This was like week two. Uh, but as a quick review, um, you can basically take a delimited file using the cut command and tell, give it the delimiter. In this case, uh, the first example is the delimiter is a colon. And then the next argument is which field you want. So it takes the file takes the delimiter, breaks it down, treats it so if there's the delimiter appears four times, it thinks basically there's five columns. And you name it F0, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5. And it'll grab whatever column applies. So 
All that heavy duty work you guys are doing in the database class, messing with CSV files, not my guys, anybody who had Kamari. Uh, <laughs> those guys suffered, I'll admit it, with the CSV files that were badly formatted. Uh, the cut command you could have used to actually break the file apart into component pieces and to rebuild it. And it's kind of cool. And you can output separated files, uh, separate fields. So you can say, I want to take the password uh, file and extract columns one and three. So it would grab the username and their group, if I remember right off the top of my head. The, there goes that one. Don't get your hopes up. Steam. Okay. Functions. Because I'm trying to finish off the bash scripting. Functions. Do you guys know what a function is, right? I hope you do. Also known as a method. What do you want, cloud phone? You just space them out one after another. You go dash name space han dash m time plus 90. So any file username han modified more than 90 days ago. You just keep giving it arguments one after another. So find space path space the rest of it's all arguments. You can give it basically one of every argument. You could say any file modified by cloud phone less than 90 days ago that's greater than 250k. And you can just feed it one argument after another. So that's the find command. That's just how it works. OK, functions. Same thing as a method or function in Java or a function in databases or functions in PHP, any programming language, essentially. Functions in JavaScript. Function of self-contained blocks of code. They can be reused. Usually returns a result of some sort. Now, functions are literally looks just like a JavaScript or a Java function. Function, function name, brackets, curlies, and a bunch of statements. Obviously, the function name is required in this case, unlike some languages that have anonymous functions and or closures, such as JavaScript and PHP, where you can have functions that don't have names, because you can. Um, you must give it a name, so no anonymous functions. The braces are required. The parentheses are required, um, or you can use both. Believe it or not, you can actually ignore the word function if you choose to. Any commands inside the curlies is any valid shell command. So anything you can run from a shell, you can put in there. And you can use the function by knowing its name. It's known as a function call, obviously. Here's an example. Function display hello brackets, curly echo hello, close bracket, and then you could just type in the command display hello. You can also choose to not have the word function. So you can choose to create functions and not actually say it's a function, but it does the exact same thing. It works. Nope. You don't need brackets to call it. The only time you'd use the brackets is if it required arguments which I'm pretty sure is an example in here on how to do that. So we'll get to it in a minute. Um, I did go through the slideshow. I'm just, I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. Uh, functions are placed at the beginning of a script or before the function call. Uh, unlike certain languages which you may be used to using, where you can basically declare a function anywhere as long as it's inside the compiled scope. So in other words, your function exists inside the scope of whatever you're working on. It doesn't care if it's declared before or after because the whole file gets read, it gets interpreted, compiled, and then executed. And by that point in time, the functions are defined in memory. I'm getting a lot of echo from you two. With, since this is a script, and if anybody here has ever worked with older programming languages, you'll understand about what they call top-down which means it reads line one, then it reads line two, and then it reads line three. And if you try to call something before it's been seen once, you'll never be able to call it. So all your functions are declared at the top of the file. And then you call it. Or at least you must declare the function before you call it. So I've seen really bad spaghetti code where 
you got a function, then it gets called, and you got a function, then it's called, and function, then it's called. If you're going to do that, just put all the functions at the top so it's all in one clean place, so you're not constantly jumping through your spaghetti code. Um, execution is immediate. When you call the function, literally the shell will run all the commands right away. Uh, there's no such thing as um, a deferred command. And if you try to call a function before you've defined it, you're going to get a command not found. So for example, uh, if you did function test1, echo, this is test1, test2, the end of test1, then you have the other function, and you call test1, the good news is by the time you've called test1, test2 has been declared. So you could actually put test2 up here, then test1, or test1 that calls test2, as long as the command calling test1 is after all the functions that have been declared, it'll work. The, this is, if pe when people start using functions inside of bash scripts, and you're used to languages like Java or PHP where you can basically put your function declarations anywhere inside your code within, well, obviously, obviously the allowable range of the scope, this one cares, and it cares an awful lot. Implementing functions. Uh, to avoid errors, um, always remember to include the word function or include the brackets. Um, don't include the brackets, obviously, if you're calling uh, the function. Um, and you can use an editor, save it as a file, then write it, or you can literally sit at the command prompt and start typing in the word function. So you can actually type in your entire function while sitting at the command prompt and then run it. Um, you can pass values in, and it is a little different. Earlier, I got it wrong a little bit. For example, if you look at this function declaration, there's no arguments inside the brackets. It's just like when you call a shell script where you have uh, the arguments that come in. Same deal. Dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and when you call it, be you know argument two, argument one, whatever you want. So display it three six would echo three six. Yeah, yeah. So. There's a, this, the, this, this example is actually a shell script that's called display it. Inside of display it, there's a function called display it. Just, you know, no, let's not be obvious with what things are called. And inside of it, inside that shell script, it actually calls this function, but it's actually reversing the arguments. So display it 3.6 will echo 6.3. So if you really want to understand how this is working, copy paste it. Wow. Actually, that one you can copy paste. There's no quote marks. Uh, if there's quote marks, type it in. But essentially, that'll reverse it. So the dollar sign one, dollar sign two here are the ones coming in from the command line. These ones are the arguments being passed in within the program. So the dollar sign one, dollar sign two is scoped. Do you guys know what scoping means, I hope? It's like in Java, where does your variable live? Does it live inside your method, inside your class, or outside the class? Or if you're working in PHP, does it include the globals? Because you can have globals. Um, same deal, pay attention to your scope. Unfortunately, you don't get the change of what the arguments are called. It's all going to be dollar sign one, dollar sign two to dollar sign nine. And here's a slightly Longer example. And basically put, you got a function called compare nums, 10.5, and you got a bunch of if statements. Then it outputs whether something's greater than, less than, or equal to. You know your little game that you had to write for Java? I should have made you guys write it in Bash. <laughs> because you know what? You could actually write that entire thing in Bash and probably be about a quarter of the code. Don't take it as a personal challenge. <coughs> um, 
Hey? Yeah. Actually, I should make somebody write that game in Postgres triggers. <laughs> That's not mean. I could bet. I'd say use Python. Like, really? Um, so here's a slightly more complex function. And it's kind of cool. As you can see, it's called LS parts. And what it does is it actually creates variables and sets them to a value of each of the pieces of an LS statement. And so it calls LS parts, and it executes command ls-l. And it passes in an argument called number one, which is what's coming from the command line. And essentially, as the function creates the variables, here's where the weird scoping business happens. Can you notice something that's a little odd? Command line arguments are scoped. So if you call a function, its arguments are contained inside itself. However, if you look at this function, inside this function, I'm creating a big pile of variables, and they're magically available outside. So scope is arbitrary. It doesn't follow any real rules. You can create objects and variables inside of a function, and then they magically become global to the script. However, command line arguments are not global. Why? Bash things. The, how do you get used to dealing with it? You just keep writing programs until you learn it. Um, how are you going to get tested on this? Not a whole lot. Um, now, so what this one's doing is the function gets called, actually the script gets called, it passes in a single argument, a file name. And it does an ls-l on that file name. In other words, it says, give me a long listing. So if you look in the comment at the top, you'll see permissions and then the um, links to it, owner, group, file size, date, well, the modified date, and the file name. And basically put, when you look at it, it's literally eight pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the modified date and time. And it'll literally take the contents of this, pass it into this, and each of those will be treated as a separate argument to the function. And it's populating variables with each of the possible values. Then when you're done, echo file has link count blank and is size blank long. In other words, it'll pass, it'll output the file, which is file one. So it'll say file one has one link and is 126 bytes long in this example. It's a good way to actually see how it actually grabs all the bits and pieces from the file system. Okay, scope, as I've been making fun of scope. There's an actual slide on scope. Variables have scope. Obviously, scope is where the values can be accessed. Variables are usually available globally. However, there's the possibility of creating local scope, which are known as the command line arguments. Um, you, uh, as usual, you cannot modify a local variable outside the function in the main part of the script. However, the value of the function, the variable is available. So the function sets the value, but the, the rest of the program can't change it. But it can read it. So imagine in Java where you had something called semi-public. Protected. Yeah. So one way, it's like a protected val variable where you can read the value but not modify it. So instead of actually being able to set the value, instead of having a setter and a getter, all you have is a getter. And there's a scope example. Obviously, the, we've already seen examples of how the scope works. So inside the scope, x is 5. Outside of the scope, x is 10. Um, you can only use local statements within a function. In other words, uh, for the variables inside of a function can't reach for variables outside of itself. Only what's been passed in. But anything inside of it gets passed out. So it's kind of weird. 
And it's the exact same example. All right, so we have a few other things we can include. Uh, functions can have a return status. In other words, you can choose to return a status. Normally, you'd return 0 or 1. And remember what I said earlier about how Linux commands are a little different than what you guys might be used to in Java? Because what's a Boolean in Java in every sane programming language? True is equal to and false is equal to. OK, so in bash land and every Linux command, success, also known as true, is and false and failure is anything not, which usually is one. So just remember that Booleans are backwards. Just like that dumb friend. They're always back. They always get everything wrong because they do it all backwards. And as always, you can do a return. Return 0, return 1. So you can check, see if a file exists. And you can tell it the file has been removed or the file has not been found. And it, it's like magic. Now, a shell script can export a function. So it's available to a different shell script. What's kind of weird is uh, Inception, like the movie, right? Each layer goes in deeper. The funny thing is, is if you create a shell script with a function and then it calls another shell script, that function doesn't exist for that shell script. Unless you pass it in. How do you pass the function in? You export it. And then what does that mean? You ready? That means everything has access to this function. Now your function is walking around with its pants around its ankles. Because every single other program in the system can now, well, anything inside your current shell can now see that function. So basically what you're saying, this function is, I don't know how to even explain that to someone who's used to programming in Java. So you wrote one Java program. And you can say, see this method in this class? I'm going to export that. So next time I run a Java program, that function's available to it. Y no. It's more, I picture it more as long line of, you ran a Java application. It creates the function, puts it in memory as a service. Java application terminates. It's still in memory, do it, waiting for something to happen. Two hours later, another Java program launches. And it says, oh, by the way, does this function exist? Yes, let's use it. So you could have a chunk of code written by Sun and suddenly get called by, by a chunk of code written by Apache. And they're just happen to be sitting in, in memory, waiting for someone to call it. Yeah, it's gross. For example, you could do, literally, this is a copy-paste from a shell routine where create a function called hi, and then I call bash. Hi is not found, so I exit. And it can now, believe it or not, I'm actually quit the, the inner shell. I can go export dash f for function hi. I can go back into my inner shell, and magically now it's available to me. Well, no, it doesn't get a specific memory address. Whatever. It says if I shout out of the room, say, remember the number 95, I'll ask for it in two hours. And then two hours from now, I say, what was that number again? Where is it in your head? I don't know, but your head knows it's 95. <coughs> All right. Uh, not quite. I think I know what you're trying to say. Not 100% sure what it is you're trying to achieve, which is why my brain is not liking what you just said. Um, but it'd be more, yeah, it's similar to that as in you have a directory full of files, and then you export the content listing of that file to somewhere in memory, and then later on you can call that. 
anywhere, even though, so you have a bunch of files, you list them to memory, create a function that knows the contents of this directory, nuke that directory, two hours later you could ask it, what were the files again? And then it, as far as it's concerned, those files still exist until you disabuse it of the reality. But yeah, that's essentially that you can actually create objects in memory that are just waiting for shit to happen. It's useful in its own way as in, um, I've known several people where they created a bunch of functions ahead of time and they included them in their bash rc file. If you, you may not have looked inside your, uh, your home directory all that much, it was a file called bash rc. And <coughs> bash rc is a bunch of settings. So it's, I, I've known some people that define some functions ahead of time so that later on they want to run some command. They didn't want to actually create a shell script and said they had a function. So then they could just call their function whenever they wanted from their other bash scripts. So they pre-can functions and store them in memory. I personally think it's a terrible idea. But you know, some people do that. Uh, but this allows you to do one thing that allows you to mimic imports. So for example, you could have a file that has all your usual functions inside of it. So it defines the function, then it exports the function, defines the function, exports the function, defines the function, exports the function. And then another bash script can now run with all those functions already pre-exported in memory. So but the cool part of that one is script one includes script two, which you know sets up all the functions. Two hours later, you could call script three without any include, and it would still work. So yeah, it's kind of an include to memory permanently until you close your bash script, your bash terminal. Then it goes away because the environment's gone, right? So the next victim. Arrays. Okay, who doesn't know what an array is? Okay, good. See, I asked this last year, last term. At about this point in the term, said, who doesn't know what an array is? And three quarters of the class did this. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> so, which is why I always enjoyed teaching database level two, because he knew what the heck an array was. <laughs> All right. An array is a variable that contains a series of elements. You access an element of an array using a subscript. Subscripts are created when the array is created, but they cannot be changed or deleted. So unlike arrays in sane programming languages where you can push, pop, or delete an array element, once you've created your array, your array is static. So it's a bit like uh, arrays in C++. Anybody here ever touch C++ or C? C, arrays are, st arrays are static. Once you've defined an array, you can't actually change it. If you want to change your array, is you create a new array, add the first array into it, then add whatever values you wanted to it. Destroy the old array and basically move the other one and then you clone it into the old array. It's really disgusting. Um, that's why people actually write functions to manipulate arrays. And people created all these helper functions. Um, in C and C++ arrays are static. And in the bash scripts, same deal. So the example is food equals bracket, uh, parentheses, sandwich, chicken, spinach, lettuce, and apple. Close parentheses. And now I could go echo, dollar sign, curly, food, Item number four. It's terrible syntax, but that's just how it's written. So when do you use an array? When you have values that are similar in nature, just like you would in Java. Um, you can refer to all the data by referring to the entire array variable. You use the subscript to access a specific part. Um, and you can process large amounts of data by accessing the variable in memory. Um, you used declare to declare an array. So if you want an array named car, you go declare dash A. Otherwise, it doesn't know it's an array. Magic. Um, the array is created automatically, and it automatically sets the index. The index is also known as a subscript. So if you see the slide that says subscript, you can replace it with the word index. And you only have numeric indexes for your arrays, which I think is actually how it is in Java also. 
Um, otherwise, it's known as a hash. So in Java, your arrays are numeric in nature, as in each key is a number that matches a value. If you want to use named keys, you can't. You have to use a different structure. And you can assign values by naming a specific uh, subscript. For example, car 0 is a Crown Vic, car 1 is a caravan. Whoever wrote these slides loved big cars. I've actually had all of those. <laughs> yeah. No, mine was non-standard Crown Vic. It was a Crown Vic with a 302 Cobra under the hood. So it basically had the motor of a Mustang in cap. <laughs> so it sounded like a Mustang and it looked like an old man's car. I could also melt my rear tires. I've had a caravan because I've had kids. I had a Buick for a while because my caravan got smashed and I rented a Buick. So I've driven all of those. As you can see, values are quoted. Elements are separated with a space. So for those of you that are used to using semicolons or commas separate your array elements, TFB, you're using a space. <coughs> eh? Huh? Too frigging bad. <laughs> the space separates each element. Or you can actually add to an array. It's static, yes. But you can actually add a new element, theoretically, by going plus equals. Yes, car plus equal, bracket, uh, parentheses, quote, car name. No spaces anywhere. And if you want to add more than one car, you've got to do multiple plus equals. Uh, plus equal is a, is a operator that Java people don't know. But it exists in other languages, such as Python and PHP. So if you come from a scripting background, plus equals the best thing ever. Um, it's static, but it's not. It actually rebuilds it in memory every single time. It is not, it is not memory efficient. So unlike, for example, in PHP or in Python, where you add an element to an array, you'd go array square brackets equal whatever the value is. It literally just goes array plus one element. In the shell script, what it'll do is it'll go car. It'll temporarily copy car to another memory space and then loop through it and rebuild car. So if you're working with a thousand array elements, it's going to loop through it a thousand and one times. Uh, just be careful. Array elements can be numbers. And how do you assign numerical grades to an array? Just like this. Grade is equal to 100, 99, 85, 88, 97. And as you can see, arrays are zero-based, just like in Java. Unlike some other languages where arrays are one-based, which actually are becoming rare and far in between, but basically starts at zero and moves on. And accessing the values inside the array, once again, it's array name, square brackets, array element. And you can theoretically take the contents of the array element and assign it to a variable, just like you do in Java. This is nothing new. Syntax is weird, but it's nothing you haven't seen before. Okay. Um, the importance of braces. So once again, we got our food list. Sandwich, check in. Spinach, lettuce, and apple inside of parentheses. If we go echo dollar sign curly, food for close curly, curly is also known as braces, it'll give you apple. But if you just go echo dollar sign food for, it'll literally output sandwich for. Why? Bash. Um, Essentially, what it does is it grabs, literally, dollar sign food, it grabs the very first value and then outputs the square brackets and four. Um, as always, you can play with your array numbers. You can put in math. 
So you want food starting at position one, add two. And if I go back, you'll see it'll say lettuce. Position one is chick, plus two is lettuce. You can also go five minus one. Five, which is actually not even going to be in there. Um, it'll go five minus whatever the heck that was, the example. Minus one, which will give me apple. And you can also set a variable and access a variable. So you can say t plus one. So it'll give, give you, once again, it'll give you apple. Because t is set to three. Three plus one is four. What's in slot number four? Apples. Inside the range, you're okay. If it ends outside the range, you either get an error or you get nothing. It just depends what kind of mood it's in at that, that point. Okay, so let's say you want to know how many array elements are in there. It's an important thing to do. And basically put, you'd go echo dollar sign curly, whatever the array is called, square bracket asterisk. And it'll output how many array elements? Five. <coughs> um, you can also choose to include a hash mark. Um, with the star, it refers to the entire element. With the hash mark, it says number inside the array element. Those are the two different syntaxes um, to access that. So the second one will give you how many elements there are. The first one will give you all the elements in one go. It's kind of weird. And uh, there's an if statement. So it'll check to see if element number two is empty. So you ask, you know, if you access something outside of the, the, array, the array list, what does it get? It'll return a zero. So if you go, for example, if you use the food example, you go food bracket 10, what would it return? A zero. Not an empty, zero. What happens if you actually have an array element nine and the value is zero? How do you know you got it right or not? You know, you do the grades, 100, 98, 95, Chad's failed with a zero, 63, and then I go access element number three, which is the zero, and it says, oh, it's zero. Well, how do you know if it's zero or not? You don't. Um, Thus, you want to see how large the element, the element, the list is, and then you can assume any values inside smaller than the range will give you a real value. And the dumbest of all statements, the last slide is so dumb for you guys, but you can actually use read to populate a array, uh, an array. So. For example, one of the bash scripts you guys were doing was inputting grades, right? Theoretically, you could actually use an array and populate the array from the read statements. And you go enter total number of entries, how many items are being included, and then it'll loop for the number you just inputted. And then you can go enter value and populate it into each of the array elements. And as if you notice, Right here, it'll read into entries dollar sign $n, which is coming from our loop. So it'll actually populate the array with the values you typed in based on the loop. Just like this, just like Java, this is probably the most complicated example today. Um, but yeah, you can use read and populate an array. That was the last slide. Um, so. Yeah, and it took exactly one hour to cover two slideshows. Now, um, just to make sure I clarify the rest, uh, I'll be here next week to answer questions. So if anybody has stuff they don't understand, like you leave here today and you go, what the heck was I thinking about? Uh, I'll be here for that. You can also demo your labs. Don't worry about Lab 8. They even though it says it's due today. As long as you get the last three labs done before, you know, the exam, I'm happy. I'd rather you demonstrate than submit for two reasons. One, 
You demonstrate I can see if you did anything wrong right away. Two, you show it to me in person, I'll give you a chance to fix it. You submit online and you don't show it to me, I, you get whatever you get. I see anything wrong in your script, it's minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So it's to your best interest to demonstrate it to me. I don't care if you don't want to show it to me. You want to just submit and say, I don't want to see Dan again because he's a vulgar arsehole? That's fine. You don't need to come back to class. However, by the same token, this is the guy that determines what kind of grade you're going to have. So you might want to put up with me for an extra five minutes because literally um, some of you have already demonstrated their labs all the way to the end. And how long does it take to demonstrate your labs to me? Three minutes? About a minute a lab unless there's something wrong. And then, you know, I actually sit there with you and go through your, your code and see what's wrong with it so that hey, you don't waste your time an hour because of a space. And somebody just giggled when I said that. But you know what? I had someone come into class and they'd fought with their script for two and a half hours. And I looked at them going, this should work. Wait a minute. Let's put a space here and here. And it worked. <coughs> it's better to show it to me than just accept a not perfectly non-functioning script. Um, I'm also going to double check the dates just to make sure I'm not lying. Okay. April 10th is your last test. 10, 1, 0. April 10th is your second midterm. I don't know why it's called a midterm. It's a test. So test 2. What is the format of test 2? Same format as test 1. You come to class. You'll have your VM. You'll have the slides. You will have X number of minutes. I'm still whittling down the number of questions, but it looks about to be about 50. It'll be about an hour and a half because I'll be more generous with the time. Um, eh? <laughs> um, no. We get to run our classes whichever we, we choose to. This is how I choose to run mine. Just, just a minute. So also, as you've been warned, the final exam is, if I remember right, 80 questions. Scantron closed book. When is the final exam? Saturday at 10.30 in the morning. That applies to you guys too, by the way. Everybody's at the same time, all in the gym. It's the same exam. It's multiple guests, Scantron closed book. Just like you guys are more prepared than my guys. I'm nice to my guys. But by the same token, as my students have experienced, open book is a double-edged sword because you spend more time looking up answers and then you run out of time. And you end up guessing on the last 10 questions. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. No. No, it, cover, it picks up right after test one, but... That, thank you for reminding me. It includes the hybrids. And this is really, really important. If you haven't done the hybrids, that applies to you guys too, because I think you guys have the same hybrids. There's questions on the final exam from the hybrids. Especially those three lessons, the one that includes the, micro, the, the crap about the microkernels. I guarantee that is on the tests. Just I had to actually go look through all the course material to figure out where the heck that was even coming from. <laughs> when I saw it on the tests. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the questions in the tests and then the hybrids is that what's important. No. If it's in the slides or in the hybrids, that's what you're getting tested on in the tests. Well, you're getting tested on what's in the slides and in the hybrids.
Yeah, the Vim ones, yeah. which is the Vim Tutor, which I posted on Blackboard. You go type in Vim Tutor from the command line, and you go through the tutorial. No problem. But all the answers are actually already posted on there. And black, like on the hybrids, the answers are there for the Vim Tutor. That is what is on the tests. Um, like I said, my test will be the f an hour and a half, roughly, online, multiple guests. Yes? I will be releasing the test questions, not the answers. Um, but you will be able to go back and look at your tests and see which answer, which ones you got wrong, which is almost as good as, because it tells you where you were weak. Um, also, as I've said, I'm going to be adjusting the grades from test one, just a little. So for those of you that had a 97, you now will have 100% just so you know. Because I made the test out of 55, but it's actually supposed to be out of 50. Ah, so if you actually got more than 50, you got 100% on the test. So congratulations. For everybody else, that's going to bump some people that might have failed into a pass. So basically, everybody's moving up about 3 to 5% overall. So take whatever number you have, and make that out of 50, and that's what your midterm grade, midterm one grade was. Obviously, I, was, I, don't, I, I never give more than 100%. So I don't believe in more than 100%. There's no such thing as more than 100% in the world, except for inflation. That's the only place where things go up more than 100% at once. <laughs>